This week's episode of Tech Hill is brought to you by the fine folks at Data Robotics, Netflix, and Domain.com. Coming up on the show, one of Garnett Lee is in the house. We got Data Robotics Drobo Share. Let you share your Drobo over a network, and it's pretty painless. We're going to let you know how fast it is. And if you're going somewhere far away, afraid you're going to get lost and never found again, Spot's personal satellite tracker might be the answer, or maybe not. We got all that and a whole bunch of your tech questions coming up on this episode of Techzilla. Welcome to TechZilla. I'm your host, Patrick Norton. And I'm Garnet Lee. Who you should know, actually, is from the fabulous OneUp.com. Garnet's worked for us, worked with us, actually, in the past. We've done stuff together. What do you do at OneUp.com? That's like a video game. I site, hold right? the glue together. I do that OneUp Yours podcast, which a lot of people listen to, get a lot of good feedback on that. I'm going to be at GDC. One up yours. I know, it's a nice, clever name, right? Sophisticated humor. It's very sophisticated. We might have a couple of adult beverages. Also going to do a cool panel at the Game Developers Con. Uh, GDC. That's the thing. The, at the Game G Developers Conference. <laughs> where we're going to let the developers come and grill journalists about what they want to know about how we get into their games. You know, why do we give them a hard time? How do we give them a hard time? So, What exactly does a score of 9.1 mean? <laughs> why did you give my game a 7? <laughs> why has there never been a score lower than 7 on your website? Um, hmm. Right, we might have some debate about that question, right? So it's going to be fun. You know, we do good stuff like that. I like it. we got a great show lined up for you today. Uh, Data Robotics Drobo Share. We're going to review in that. The Spot Personal Satellite Tracker, which is this thing right here, which essentially, it's a panic button if you're in the middle of nowhere and well out of the range of your cell phone. And uh, of course, we've got a stack of viewer questions you guys send in. So now, for those of you who are not in the know, Garnet, of course, hails from 1up.com. And uh, are, you, are you still reviewing? Am I still reviewing? Are you still reviewing games? We review games. Not, not one up. One up.com is obviously reviewing games. Are you still reviewing <laughs> oh, games? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the most fun parts of the job, right? Is taking a game home, getting to play it, and then, well, we don't really get to play them at work. I mean, that's the big myth, right? right. Is that we play games at work? You know, we don't play games at work. I know, I've actually walked in and had you, have, you've had actually had two consoles and a, a PC based game running at the same time when I've walked into your office. I know, with multitasking. Uh huh. It's pretty impressive. So, isn't you're it? proof, like, anybody out there who doesn't think they can get a job in gaming or, like, the mom's giving you the pain, are you, like, proof that you can make your living in gaming? Well, I mean, we're all proof that we can make our living doing whatever we want to, right? And, and this is. <laughs> who said I wanted to do this? <laughs> <laughs> your mom I want to be on of the course. forward assembly line. That's a scary thought. So, what's the big release? What's the next big gaming release coming out? It actually just came out this week on Tuesday uh, Burnout Paradise. It's on 360 and PS3. Absolute blast to play. And Especially if you have online. So this is a game where you get to play with race cars in a city, and it's it's more fun than just having structured races. It has structured races and all that kind of stuff, but whatever. That's not the fun part. The fun part is you pull in your friends real quick, play bumper cars, driving like around the city. Taxi driver without the weird. Taxi driver without the weird stuff. It's really and the graphics are really pretty. It looks a little better on PS3, and especially fun is that when you take someone out, if they have the USB camera mm -hmm. that goes in the in the system, it'll wait two seconds and flash and take their picture. So it's, <laughs> exactly. Rude. So it, it's great because and they didn't originally have the delay in there. What they did was they put the delay in because what they found is. Instead of taking the picture right when you you know crashed, which got people upset, right. it's like people would go, oh, ah! <laughs> they'd have fun with it, right? So it's really cool. That's a scary it's a blast. Thing. Is it is it basically online gaming compatible between the different the consoles? It's and not. PCs, you know, we're not going to see that for a long time. As long as you've got Microsoft Camp in one in one camp and and Sony in another, and they're not going to let their systems talk to but each Sony other. Sony plays so well with others, oh, just yeah. like Microsoft. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write that down. Sony plays well with others. Good, yeah. good for them. And so does Microsoft. Your comments. Should we fire up some of the first viewer comments? Let's rock and roll. All right, first one comes from Eric in Gilroy, California. Eric writes in, first off, I really enjoy the show. Thank you, Eric. But I was wondering if you'll be putting out an HD podcast in iTunes. It would be nice to have when using my Apple TV. Eric, as a matter of fact, we already have our HD version of uh, the video available. Uh, it's just not listed on the HD section in iTunes. No, I, I don't want them to see my pores. <laughs> they don't need to see me in HD. It's not quite. It's not quite. It's not like a full 720p or 1080p okay, well, HD, right but it's a 16 by 9. It's going to scale nicely out to the HDMI port on your Apple TV. Um, and actually, you can add the RSS feed. The links are up on the show page. As a matter of fact, I think the video is coming up right now, and you can actually see. Uh, as we click on our fabulous new website, you can subscribe to the QuickTime HD and just add that into your iTunes subscription. 
couple of clicks and you're there. Congrats on the new site, by the way. It looks fantastic. I really like it. It's shiny, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I work on a website and I looked at that site right off the bat and went, wow, that is an excellent design. It's really friendly, easy to get into and out of. It has a nice polished design to it. Well, I want to thank uh, Stephanie and Ron and the rest of the crew who worked on that because they suffered. I hope you guys like that website because they suffered to bring you that website. You got the next one? I do. We've got a, a next email comes from Ron in North Carolina and it is also about the uh, recent Apple TV announcement. So he says, hey, Patrick, after the announcements at CES and Macworld of the hardware devices like Apple TV to get movies and watch them on television, I see that Time Warner is testing software to track how much bandwidth a person is using. Then they would charge that person extra money each month. So wouldn't that kill the products like Apple TV if I tried to download an HD content movie and the cable or DSL provider charged me $30 for extra download usage? From Ron from in Ron. North Carolina. Well, I mean, you know the story here. This is, is it 2008 or is it 1998? Oh man, it's it, what it is is it basically there's there's a lot of that you know AT and T right they had their, one of their technical economists a couple of years ago wrote a paper that said we can't afford to have you using the bandwidth you think uh, you're paying for 24 seven. Now one of the responses to that is to do throttling, which is something that uh, they basically magically slow down things. They think you know they'll monitor your bandwidth if they think you're using too much bandwidth. They might have a monthly cap. Uh, um, you know what they're talking about here is making you pay for the amount you use, just like your water right. bill or your phone bill. So or... it's bandwidth metering. Yeah. But here's the problem: is is we're moving with more and more content distributed right. through the net, not less and less. How are they? Why are they not spending the money on Doxis three, better backend network management? That's well, where they need to be okay. spending the money. This is a this is an experiment, right? It's a small mm -hmm. town in Texas. I believe a relatively small town in Texas compared to like Houston, Beaumont, Beaumont. And what they're doing is this is a trial. Right? So, you know, what this is going to hit, it's not just Apple TV, it's not just video downloads, it's software upgrades. I mean, look at the size of the service packs on Windows SP, uh, Windows XP or Vista. It's peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Basically, this is Time Warner going, you know, I bet we can make a lot of money if we charge people for the amount of bandwidth they use if they use a lot of bandwidth. Am I too much of a conspiracy theorist to think that maybe they're feeling a little threat from the sort of downloads that might be coming over iTunes, that sort of <laughs> stuff upsetting their, you know, they're, they're big money. They make a lot of well, money I off mean, of on-demand content, right? You know, Comcast, Time Warner, Cox, uh, you know, AT&T, anybody who's who's distributing, you know, anybody who sells, anybody who acts as an ISP, anybody who sells bandwidth, delivers it to your doorstep, they want to make more money. And this is, this is an opportunity for them to figure out whether or not they can get people to pay more money. It's, it's basically everybody's going to be watching. With VZ already said they're happens. not even going to touch it. Right. Yeah, well, then we're all going to be running on VZ. I'd love some Fios. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Yeah, Fios would be nice. Fios, of course, is fiber to the curb, which is super fast, super amazing, and available in, like, Long Island in one other place. Hey, listen to the last Techzilla, the Macworld one at this point in time. I think I can upgrade your last response to the SVC host email. Here's a quick rundown. This is actually pretty good. This is a good tip. Get Process Explorer from Sys Internals. That's Microsoft owned now. We'll let you uh, get that URL from the uh, show page. You're going to highlight SVC host or run DLL32 process with the mouse. And the tooltip box is going to tell you the registered name of the DLL. So the idea is that it basically tells you what punched through that normally unidentified process running on your system. Now, something else you can try is right click and use properties to see the TCP IP tab. If a keyboard driver you know, it's basically connecting to a remote site, let's say with a dot .ru uh, at the end of it, you probably have some really nasty stuff running in your system. So he's got a point. If you simply tell, uh, Eric's got a very good point. If you simply tell the average person that the SVC host is a bad thing, they will kill the process and then call us, I'm a sysadmin because Windows is not working anymore. And yes, we actually pointed out that SVC host is responsible for a lot of perfectly normal uh, features inside of Windows, such as DNS queries, the sort of thing you'd like to use if you want to use the internet. Yes, yes, this is true, Eric. But, you know, I stand by the basic uh, SVC host versus SV host. And, you should investigate, and that's actually a great tip. Sys internals, free. There you go. Yes. Don't let yourself get hijacked. I hate being hijacked. We got some good stuff coming up after the break, including a look at Spot's personal locator beacon and Data Robotics Drobo Share. Sit tight. And we want to point out the following segment is sponsored by Data Robotics, maker of the Drobo. Drobo is the world's first storage robot, infinitely expandable, and provides raid like reliability without the technical hassles of RAID. Key features of the Drobo include self monitoring, self healing, and an easy to understand visual status and alert panel. Expands forever, the highest CNET rating for storage ever amongst the many awards the Drobo has won. And uh, you can save $50 when you're buying a Drobo by putting the discount code TECZILLA, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A, if you order one from the Drobo store. 
So we asked you guys a few shows ago about Time Machine, and we've gotten several responses via email. First one comes from Michael in California. He writes us, heard you ask for a review on Time Machine on Mac. Love it, but here's a tip. Click on Time Machine, do backup, and then delete the file right off your desktop. If you need it later, just pick it up in Time Machine. Most of the files I work on, I send to another office for their information. I never to be seen again by me, unless they ask for it. So then I go to Time Machine. That's from Michael in Imperial Beach, California. That's a good one. All right, Keith says, Time Machine worked okay with Tiger, but it is a little heavy on the system processes. Under Leper, it's been a mixed bag, or Leopard, as most people would call it. He's got 99 gigabytes stuck on a server. He can't update or restore because the software is so unstable, it crashes every time he goes to use it in Leopard. Now, on a fresh install of Leopard, he says, Time Machine is very handy for relocating software, reloading software, and users onto a system. He can still use the Time Machine backups from the previous install and restore files from it. I'm, I'm sensing a sort of Leopard issues here. Doesn't seem to go that way. Uh, next one is from AJ Works at a university that uses Retrospect for 50 plus clients. Good he time. says, uh, we are actually considering letting Mac people who want to move, move to Time Machine for backup. I use it myself and I like it. Granted, it's not quite as full featured as larger backup clients, but it's just so damn easy for a user POV. Now I work as a Mac supporter in the CompSci Institute, only a dedicated Mac supporter for the whole university, actually. And a large part of my job is also annoying people who aren't backing up regularly. <laughs> hey, how many times have you heard that before? That's really funny. Have you backed up? <laughs> have you backed, backed up? up? We have some solutions for that later, don't we? But should to, and, and to remind them to turn on the respective clients. And if these are issues, to get them working again. Rare occasion, believe it or not, 95% of the time, it's poking them and just saying, have you turned off your client again? So moving those people who would use Mac to Time Machine will let me almost forget about them. Time Machine lacks customization options, and it's easy to automate it back up to a NAS or safe server, but its extreme ease of use is a huge plus for servers for whom backups aren't mission critical. Thanks, AJ. So that was yeah. in-depth. It was very in-depth. The man's supporting a lot of people. Now, uh, we got one more. Uh, my experience with Time Machine on a Leopard upgrade is such that I honestly believe it was put together by former Vista programmers. Ouch. I plugged in a Seagate USB Firewire external to the Firewire 400 port, and the only consistent behavior I get out of it is a system freeze requiring a forced shutdown and restart. Sad behavior for a computer that went eight months of constant use once and without needing a reboot, and then only because of a system patch. So Walter from Birmingham, Alabama is not real happy with uh, Leopard and Time Machine. Jan told us that you make sure you don't leave your external drive turned off, because in which case, T, uh, Time Machine can't write to it. <laughs> that <laughs> that'd be, be a bad. small problem. <laughs> and then Curran says it's harder to use on a laptop than a desktop since, quote, it only backs up if your external drive is connected for an extended period of time, which is a rarity on your laptop. I end up connecting the drive and just manually starting the backup every time. And uh, Deshaun, Walt, David, Matt, Chris, and Jeff have all had solid luck with it, mostly on Tiger. The, the Leopard thing is just upsetting people. It is a lot, isn't it? Yeah. All right, I love getting lost in Baja, rural Nevada, Utah, chasing after like petroglyphs and all sorts of weird places to go climb. But the thing is, you wander far enough away from the highways, the cell phone cuts out, and if there's an emergency situation, you're SOL. Kids, don't ask your parents what that means. It means you're in a bad place and you can't get help. So to give you some peace of mind, uh, the folks at SPOT, the Satellite Personal Tracker or Satellite Personal Messenger, they're saying they can give you all of the safety of, a, of an EP. Well, you know what? Just I got a chance to try it out in the field. and. Uh, you know, or the docks, I should say. Check this out. Something new on the scene is the Spot, or Satellite Personal Tracker. It's an interesting idea for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's cheap, $150. And it's a little deceptive because there's a $100 annual fee to actually do anything useful with it. Second of all, it doesn't just have the Coast Guard, National Guard, Armed Forces, 911, all hell breaking loose button. It actually has a button that says, OK. You hit it, it squirts a message up to the satellite, which can take some time because it has to lock onto the Global Start satellite system. And it gets an email message up on the website. You can link onto it a map and you basically have a timestamp and a GPS location. It's got a non-life-threatening help button, which basically means I'm stuck here, I'm broken, I'm not going to die, but please send someone. And then there's the 911 button, which is coordinated through the Geo Central Services that's partnered up with the spokes to do spot. Now, you notice these two lights blinking right here? That's because we haven't actually sent the satellite message yet. We hit the OK button, and when it's actually sending the message, it'll hold green for a few seconds. And that's kind of your confirmation that the message has actually been sent. There's no two-way communication here. You can't send the text message. You can't talk through it. You basically have a one-way message that goes out with time and GPS information. Now, you may think we're in a clear area right now, but the tree right here, the buildings over there, could actually be blocking our access to the satellites up in space. So you really want to get someplace high and exposed in 360 degrees. It also has a tracking mode for an additional $50 a year. We'll show you that and actually what happens when you hit the OK button back in the studio. Right now, 
I gotta let the dog loose because he's going nuts. Okay, so other than you having to wander around looking for the Costco Buscan, what's the downside to this thing? <laughs> well, uh, the Costco what? The Buscan. You know, the, the, remember the tanker that like rammed into the bridge? I'm with you now. That was, that's, that was that was obscure, man. They had it in dry dock here. Well, I they, thought you were looking for it from that video. Actually, I actually have. We weren't looking for that. We actually saw it. That's the, we basically, some people dumped a lot of oil in the area, which is being repaired down here. We thought about burning it to the ground, but the lawyer <laughs> said not to do it even for system. Um, what's amazing about this is that it does actually work, right? This is kind of like, you know, your first GPS unit where it's just incredible that the idea that, okay, it does a GPS sync, it communicates to satellite, the satellites are up in space. Um, it, it's not going to work. It doesn't really work. If you take it in the middle of a city, obviously, it's, you know, dial 911, find the payphone, beg for a cab to stop. Um, but if you're, if you're canyoneering, if you're spelunking, Right, you don't, mean, you don't mean my first in a Fisher Price sort of way. No, no, no. I mean, but, you know, when you're talking about, you know, Personal locator beacons basically have traditionally been about five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars. They basically have one setting, which is call out the National Guard, right? Because you, you set that thing off, and basically the emergency services go into effect, and they start sending bodies to that location. Search and rescue is called out. What have you Search got on rescue. this one? What you've got on this one is you know like we were talking about uh, before in the video. You got the okay, I'm fine, don't worry about it, and the help button. And the help button sends out messages, and you can see those on the screen. We can pull those up for you, and they'll basically send out a, a, like a text message. Um, or an email out to the people you want to contact. You know, so somebody's going to be like, you know, Patrick, you know, if you have this little sort of standardized message, like Patrick requests assistance, and then it gives them GPS coordinates. It gives them the, the latitude and longitude of your location. So in that sense, it's really fascinating. You know, my only fear is that somebody's like uses this in place, you know, of an avalanche beacon or common sense, or they want to travel alone. They're like, I've got the spot. Everything will be cool, you know. Um, Not suitable for that. Not, you know, it, it's not a substitute for common sense, um, but they figure anybody who's, you know, smart enough to, like, buy one of these and carry them around. I mean, the other thing is, you know, if you have to be conscious and actually, you know, crawl to an open space where you've got a view of the sky so you can actually hit the button. Um, it can be, a, it takes about 20 minutes to do a message, which can be a little, unless you have it in tracking mode, they have sort of a $50 a year. You can have tracking mode, you basically turn it on and it'll blip a message out every 10 minutes uh, uh, for long periods of time, which is kind of a trip. Um, what about the net interface? I mean, because that's really got to be a big part of this also if it's going to be a consumer device. We want to look at Google Maps, see where we're at, what's going on, that well, kind of thing, right? The, it's, the, it's pretty easy. Like you, log, you log into their website and basically they've got the OK messages and the help messages and 911 is, you know, not activated on this. We can't right. set 911 off on this, so we don't know what a 911 message looks like. Um, we don't want to. I've got a friend that does search and rescue, so obviously I don't want to get Tom out of bed at two in the morning because I accidentally hit nine. Suddenly have this horrible image of legally blonde. <laughs> <laughs> I need help, honey. I'm at the grocery store. Uh, I'm not even going there, dude. It's pretty slick. The pricing's right. Um, you know, and if you, you you know if you find yourself traveling in the middle of nowhere, which is a really different concept west of the Mississippi. You right. know, if you're in New York, it's really hard to get lost, even upstate. It's really hard to not be able to see a farmhouse in the distance in Iowa. Um, if you're talking about you know, Nevada, Utah, Iowa, and, and you know, maybe you're in Costa Rica, you may have to climb up in the triple canopy jungle, you know, but the idea is that this is going to be able to reach a satellite. I, I actually was more impressed with it than I expected it to be. Cool. You know, if I press help time. now, do you think it'll get us out of this segment? Uh, you go wander over by the window <laughs> for more information help. on my experiences with the little orange box. Check out the show notes on the site at revision3.com slash techzilla. Now, we want to take a minute to thank one of the sponsors on the show, Netflix. Yes, this week's episode of Textile is sponsored by Netflix. If you like high def, you can now get both HD DVD and Blu-ray movies and shows. Just serve on over to www.netflix.com slash techzilla where you can get an absolutely free trial. All right, right in front of me I have the Drobo. Have you seen Drobo? I have, on one of the very first Techzillas. Yes. You brought it in. You were supporting this thing. You love it. I love it. We actually use it at home and it's, you know, we've obviously showed it off. We're a sponsor. Um, I bought one before they became a sponsor, but basically it's it's not RAID, but it's RAID-like. They've got parity backup and like kind of a RAID 5, uh, multiple hard drives, and basically all you need to know to configure it is a little bit of software on your machine and watching the little lights. If the lights are green, everything's happy. If the lights are red, the drive is dead, you pull it out, you swap in a new drive. And you know, they always talk about in the advertisement, it's infinitely expandable, because basically you swap out a smaller drive and put in a larger drive as larger drives get cheaper. Big complaint from people on this has always been that it's USB only. And because it's like a RAID 5, it's not particularly fast. You're talking about on the particular drives I have in here about a uh, uh, 30 meg megabit per second or megabyte per second peak transfer at about uh, you know, a little 17 and change. It's not real fast compared to an ATA, IDE, or a SATA connection or even a single drive in USB. But what you trade off for in the 
speed uh, is to get the protection. So if one of the drive dies, you've got all the data to you're, you're, replace You're blowing the red and orange lights now. You shouldn't be flipping that thing upside down. Yeah, well, actually, I just pulled the cable out of it. Um, <laughs> hey, here's my question that I want we'll, to think a lot. let the Drobo fix itself real quick. Is it mainly a backup device, mm -hmm. or is it a device to spread files across my network or across, you know, access it from anywhere? What what is this thing? What's its best <laughs> use? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, basically, in the in the the only way you're sharing up until today, we're going to talk about the Drobo share in a second. Up until today, um, you were connecting this to a single machine, right? And if you wanted to use it to store files from across your home network, you would have to basically attach it to a Mac or PC and share it. Okay. okay. So what they've actually come out with, and I believe Eric uh, wrote in asking us about this, is the Drobo Share, which is this thin little box I have here. It's designed to stack underneath the Drobo. So you can actually attach up to two Drobos on this, uh, and it's basically a little mini server that turns the automatically turns the Drobo. You plug the Drobo into it, up to two Drobos, um, turns the Drobo. You plug your Drobos in, you plug your Ethernet in on your network, and it turns your Drobo into a mapped hard drive. No manually mapping, maps it onto OS X or onto uh, Windows. There's there's a lot of Drobo voodoo in these two boxes, I can tell already. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the Drobo voodoo is really cool because they basically may, um, uh, you know, turning the Drobo into a NAS and making the hard drive, uh, you know, the storage on the Drobo accessible to any machine running the client software in your house. That's really cool. So I think NASAs are going to be a really big part of what we do at home with computing in the next few years because all of our media is coming home. We want to get to it anywhere we go, what, you know, especially for us like in video games. Yeah. We, want to, we want to get to it on our PSP, we want to get to it on our 360, we want to get to it on our, PS, on our PS3s. Is this, an, is this what I want instead of like uh, the HP media server? Well, I mean, it's an interesting question, right? Because the, the primary competitors for, for like the Drobo, the Drobo plus the share would be something like uh, Buffalo's uh, Terra Station. Okay. Um, and here's the thing, right? You you get a lot of ease of use and convenience on this. It's it's you don't have to deal with you know you don't have to deal with complicated configuration software. Upgrading a hard drive is really really painless. On the flip side, by the time you get you know the four hundred ninety five dollar Drobo, that's fifty dollars off if you enter in Texila at the Drobo store. Wow, <laughs> I feel so dirty. Um, and but by the time you get a Drobo, which is basically five hundred dollars, four hundred ninety eight dollars, and um, it's another two hundred dollars here. Another two hundred dollars. That's seven hundred dollars. And now we got to start, and we got to drop drives drive inside there. It. Now, for a, a Buffalo Terra station, is going to cost you around seven hundred dollars um, with a terabyte of hard drives okay. loaded into it. Uh, for thirteen hundred dollars, you're going to get two terabytes of storage. So, what you're 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 definitely paying a premium by putting this together. But the trade-off is that you have, you know, simplified administration. It and seems to me like it hits a really great sweet spot for a small business owner, maybe even yeah. someone working at their house, because of the ability to, you know, swap drives in mm -hmm. and out, have that have that secure data, and not have to worry about it. Because again, like one of the things about a media server is that's not securing your yeah. data. I mean, there's nothing secure. <laughs> if that thing crashes, it's still bye bye. Well, I mean, you could also, I mean, you could do something like plug the Drobo into your media server, right? If, okay. you, if, you, if you're running the. Uh, uh, if you're running the software, I mean, one of the issues, right? If you know, it's good. To, so you have your your hard drive. You have your data on your hard drive in your notebook or your desktop machine, right? Backing up to an external hard drive is good. You know, backing up to a server is only as good as the you know hardware on that server. So if you have a single drive. You know, you have a single point of failure, right? If sure. you have a RAID one, then you've got mirror drives. You know, this even, as the machine this even enters into that up. new uh, Mac device the, that lets you back up. Yeah. Well, same again, thing. Single point yeah, of failure. Yeah, the, the sort of like you know the time capsule where they've taken a hard drive and they dropped it inside an Airport Express. You know, it's always good. You should always always have a second backup. I don't care what it's on. If it's on a USB drive, an external hard drive, you know, and it's always nice to have an extra backup outside of your house, which is what Carbonite and Mosey are good for those online backup servers, because it's doubtful that your house and like the servers where they hide the Mosey data are going to burn right. down at the same time. Uh, and yes, actually, somebody uh, asked me about that recently. I know a number of people who have lost everything when their houses burned down. That's why we hit that again. Plus, we live in San Francisco where the earth shakes and the buildings fall. Anyhow, we've got uh, links for the Drobo share in the show notes, and uh, you can get to those at revision3.com slash techzilla, or better yet, just techzilla.com. Time for a free download of the week, something you just won't be able to resist installing on your machine immediately. This week's pick from Mr. Roger Chang, our beloved series producer, the GOM player. The the what? Gom. Gom? That's one of Godzilla's opponents, right? At Gom, <laughs> Gom player versus Godzilla. Well, I, what I do know it is, it's a free media player that supports x and DivX and FLV. It's Flash, Video, AC3, AUG, MP4, H.263. It's kind of like the sort of... the sort of. It's a Swiss Army knife. Yeah, it's a good one for you. Cool. And it's not VLC, so it's an alternative to VLC, because it'll do stream WV, ASF, and ASX. Uh, not so good with the protected, the protected streams, though. The, uh, and, of course, you've got your basic video player. Roger's favorite feature, I think. 
um, is if you like click and bracket and click and click the other bracket, you can actually get it to loop. Okay, I guess that's cool. I mean, it looks pretty no-nonsense. You know what I like about this from looking at it and playing around with it? It strikes me a lot like Winamp used to be for MP3s. Plays almost every format, really easy just to pick up and use, does what you want it to do, and, and doesn't have a bunch of other stuff extraneously hung all over it. Yeah, no, it's actually pretty exciting. And you know what I also do is, is, like, I've used VLC to play DVDs that wouldn't play on any other sure. player, including expensive commercial ones. Well, this one, uh, Go will actually play broken AVA file, AVI files. So if you have, like, a partial download, it'll actually play it. Um, subtitle supports, playlist formats like M3U, uh, PLS, ASX, screen captures, and it's absolutely free. And we've got the uh, link for you up in the show notes. And you can find the show notes at techzilla.com. And uh, oh, is this episode 18? 18. 17. Episode 17. And uh, actually, while we're talking about uh, things we want to remind you of, we want to remind our beloved and loyal viewers that this awesome episode of Techzilla, at least we hope it's awesome, is sponsored by the fine folks at domain.com. Start with a domain name, build your web presence at domain.com. Domain.com offers affordable domain names, advanced hosting, and custom website design. The competition has teaser deals, but often require you to bundle in more expensive services like hosting. At domain.com, you can register your domain name for just $8.75 and make it private for $5 more. And as a special offer to Techzilla viewers, type in coupon code TECHZILLA, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A, when you're checking out, and you'll get an additional 25% discount on domains and hosting. So, hey, why not take advantage of this offer right now? <laughs> I feel so. Absolutely. And this is an awesome episode. Well, because Garnet Lee's here. That's right. Up. Totally awesome video games. Speaking of awesome video games, don't you guys have the giant pile of free video games coming up soon? We do. Actually, it's already out. It's a, it's a deal we do in conjunction with the magazine, Games for Windows, the official magazine, where we do 101 free games. So it's an, a, you know, a compilation of, of freeware, shareware, a bunch of independent game developer stuff. It is excellent. You should check it out. It's on oneup.com. That's how I found about like, the golf question mark game. You played that? Yes. That's really cool. I, I actually, my wife was pissed off I was playing that. It's so not all much. casual games either. I mean, I think a lot of people say, oh, well, it's just going to be all casual games, which, by the how way. How many versions of Bejewel can you put right. in one list? No, this is a blast. I think it's really cool. And 101 games can keep you busy for a long time. It's always one of our most popular features. It's plenty, plenty of games to get you uh, through any rainy day in San Francisco. What's your favorite one on the list? We already took golf question mark. I mean, actually, that, it's stuff like that. I haven't. I don't have a favorite because the stuff just goes all over the board. It depends on what you're in the mood for. Though my most favorite part is that there's always something there to get you going. We're gonna beat your favorite out of that and put it in the in the show notes on. There. Okay, so, show notes. I'll give it. I'll, I'll, I'll pick one. We got an email from Tim in Belgium. He writes in: I moved to Europe with my wife and newborn. We use Skype every day to communicate with our parents, who are obviously interested in seeing their grandchild. And please don't tell my mom that you guys Skype every day. She'll be all over my uh, <laughs> took us. The baby's getting older now. We spend more time chasing around the house and sitting in front of a PC monitor. Is there a Bluetooth webcam we could say put on a desk in the living room where she typically plays and still send video and audio through Skype to a grandparent? Tim, it's a great question. And as far as I know, I mean, the closest thing we found to a Bluetooth camera is a hack, actually, and it's the Mobiola web camera. And it's using a cell phone, and we've got a USB connection in it right now. Let me pull that out. And, uh, and you can actually see like the Bluetooth video coming over there, although I think I killed the connection again. And you kind of have the whole, it seems to be doing a complete screen capture and then sending it over like a 64K Bluetooth connection. There's quite connection. a bit of delay there. There's quite a bit of delay there. It supports audio and video, but it's not the most impressive combination. Um, I'd like to see it running with a different camera. That could also be partly a function of that phone, right? It could, yeah. It could also be partially a function of that phone. We've seen actually Quick, which is a pretty slick device, QIK.com. Uh, that's the one we actually talked about in System recently, where it sends it from like a Nokia phone, uh, over the, 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 the wireless network, the, your cell phone provider's network, and does a pretty good job of getting video actually up there and out. Um, wasn't not going to work for Skype though. Um, man, you know, you know me, I'm like, you know, the cheap solution. I want you to get like a 40 foot extension cable and drag your, your net cam into the living Where's room. Where's the duct tape that goes with this? I mean, come on, why am I going to traipse around the house with a 25 foot USB extension? Well, she, Jim did say that she basically plays in the, in the living room. Don't go past the coffee. I, mean, I have this image of you going past the coffee table and right. everything being swept off with the cable. Okay. The, Dog running around in circles. Well, like, let's say this. Bluetooth is out. There are 802.11 uh -huh. cameras that, that aren't cheap. You're going to have to find one and track it down. They're usually used for security. They're, some of them how about, are How about are I give good. Tim another alternative? Possibly. Please. Uh, and save he, me. And <laughs> save he, Tim. he could get a PSP out of the deal. New PSP works with Skype. I have not seen to confirm that it works with video, but the PSP does support a modular uh, camera adapter that goes right on the top of the thing. How cool would it be to be able to walk around 
follow your, your grandkids and, and you know, with your PSP, shoot them anywhere inside your Wi-Fi. Take, they go out in the backyard, you just follow them along. I, that, I think that would be a great potential solution. I think it's an extremely awesome potential solution. How much is it gonna cost? You know, I don't know the prices over in Europe, but the new uh, PSP plus the camera, I would guess somewhere around 300 euros, okay. something along those lines. Well, he's actually, he's got folks in, in the States. What's the American price? Um, so you got the new PS, I don't know. Actually, I okay. don't know the camera off the top of my head. <laughs> there you go. We need to find it, but that actually, that's actually a cool we'll idea. We'll get it for the show notes. Have you seen it? Have you actually seen the new PSP running Skype? And what's, and while, <laughs> while I'm getting agitated, since yes. I have a PSP that's a wonderful paperweight, can you actually use the, the Skype features? Because I was like, I know where you're going. You already know the answer to this question. Okay. You know that you can't. Why can't the old PSP run the Skype software? Short answer is, I don't know. Long answer is, for some reason, it makes use of the additional memory that they added into the disk buffer for the new PSPs. Look, just go buy a new PSP. Just come on. Why? I already have one paperweight. Now, don't actually, make it. There are, there are, first of all, PSP is getting a lot better support. You're going to see a lot more games coming on it that are fun to play that you're going to enjoy. And I think they're getting much better at designing portable games instead of home games that they shoehorn onto a PSP. Okay. In the meantime, you're not getting rid of your Nintendo DS, though. And what do you want, like three of those now? <laughs> One more email on the show. This one's from John out in Texas. John writes in, the HD on my laptop, that's the hard drive, I should say. Well, my laptop is nigh full, so I'm looking for a small external USB hard drive to put stuff on. What do you recommend, especially in the sub $100 range? From John in Tejas. So this is all about deciding what he needs, right? He gotta, he's got to figure out how big he needs it, what kind of interface he's regularly going to use with it, how he's going right. to, whether he's going to have separate power, does he want a standalone power, does he want well, it just to run off like, the there's, machine? There's USB, FireWire, and ESAT. In this case, John's looking for USB. Okay. That's pretty common. Um, he wants small, so that would take, you know, you have two and a half inch hard drives, three and a half inch hard drive external cases, so we're going to go for a two and a half inch hard drive external cases. Although, I got to say, if you want to get like the most capacity for a hundred bucks, Getting a full-size hard drive, like a, a three and a half inch hard drive, is going to get you more gigabytes for your money. You've got Roger's. You've got Roger's toy here, right? Yeah, actually, this Roger and I both own the fabulous. Roger paid, I think, twenty-five dollars for this. I think I bought mine on sale for fifteen. And uh, oh, that's why he paid the big money for this. It's got the eSATA connection. Mine's just USB 2.0, and it's a do-it-yourself. Um, uh, two and a half inch. Basically, put a two and a half your own two and a half uh, inch notebook hard drive inside of here. And look at the fabulous uh, eSATA connection along with the USB 2.0. You have a uh, late model computer. You can actually use the eSATA and still, of course, use this with the older machines via the USB. And one of the cool things they do with this one, a yank on the, uh, along with the fabulous case that comes with it, is they give you a power cord that will actually, uh, a pass-through power cord. So you've got a limited number of USB uh, ports on your notebook that can be really useful. Are you going to be mad at me if I said just watch the Sunday papers and pick up a turnkey solution? No. You know, I mean, actually, I'm not. Everybody it, makes those now. Yeah, everybody makes. I mean, we've we've had, uh, uh, in, you know, it seems like some of the brands coming. We've always had really good luck with uh, Buffalo's external drives. Um, Western Digital's been doing some really good jobs with external drives. What does Seagate's think about? got it? Mac Store's got it. I mean, yeah. and every weekend, Seagate I see, and Mac Store are basically the same. Somebody's is now. on sale every weekend, right? Absolutely. Although I, I got to say though, if you're looking at the circular and the weekend flyer, take a look at uh, Newegg and Tiger, sure. and shop around online first because like the the great price at the big box store down at the mall um, may actually be more expensive than the regular price at some of the online places. Like I've basically been buying all my hard drives from Newegg's lately. I could get about 160 gig that way though, right? Um, 160 for under 100 bucks. 99.99. Okay. I was thinking probably more about 100, but... 120 maybe. Hey, obviously, I need to go to the internet and search. So we put some... How about we'll search we'll put some links in the show notes. Okay, sounds so good. Some good deals. Do us a favor. If you've got a comment, a question, a suggestion, some pics of an outrageous tech setup in your house, send them on in to us. The address, as always, is techzilla at revision3.com. And don't forget to check out previous episodes of Techzilla or episodes as many people who can actually speak English natively, unlike myself. They're waiting to be discovered and rewatched at revision3.com slash techzilla. And we're in the market for a new co-host. If you have any ideas or live in the San Francisco Bay Area and you want to try out, do us a favor, send your resume and your headshot to roger at revision3.com with Techzilla co-host in the subject line. More details are going to be placed on the revision3.com website. Coming up on the next show, you're going to like this actually. Uh, uh, Kevin Rose is going to be doing this on the next show. I've heard of him. Rumor has it we're going to be talking about what may no longer be particularly important uh, 
combination Blu-ray HD DVD drives for your home theater PC. I hear that's going to stay important for uh, home movies with HD DVD. For at least a few more months, <laughs> the Warner Brothers announcement. And you know what, we got some more cool stuff coming up we can't tell you about. We want to thank you for watching. Garnet, thanks for coming by. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Pat. See you Please next time. Please come back and show us off some of those games. Of course. Golf question mark. We should start a league. Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Garnet Lee. Have a great week.